Welcome back. Uh, we are here today with Nifty, who is an incredible engineer, um, a good friend, and a person who has single-handedly, well, I don't say single-handedly, but basically you are instrumental in the development and progress on Sea Lightning, one of the more interesting uh, implementations of the Lightning Network protocol. Um, how would you tell us who you are, what you're about, and expand on my brief summary of what you do? Yeah. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Lisa, aka Nifty. Um, I work at Blockstream of Core Lightning. I've been there almost four years now. Um, class of 2018 Bitcoiner, so also four years of Bitcoining. Um, yeah, so I'm a developer by trade, but I also really like doing education instruction stuff. So beginning of this year, I started this like kind of side project thing called Base58, um, which is a Bitcoin education course. You can take it. It's a six-week class. We do cohorts. Uh, we learn. I basically teach you all there is to know about the Bitcoin transaction protocol. So it's pretty technical stuff, uh, but it's for everyone who wants to like find out how Bitcoin actually works. Um, Mostly we have like devs and engineers and IT guys kind of coming through and students, um, but we've also had some VCs and like people that want to know more about like just like the technical side of like Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that. We just finished up our like second cohort a few weeks ago. Um, and I also, I guess now I run conferences. I'm like, we're one day away from Bitcoin plus plus, which starts tomorrow here in Austin, Texas. So I am currently in a hotel room, kind of been scrambling around trying to get last minute stuff done. Um, so I gotta keep an eye on my messages. Sorry if I like seem sort of distracted. I can't tell you how much empathy I have for <laughs> the position you're in right now. Uh, I'm very honored that you were willing to still hop on and engage with us. Let's talk about Bitcoin Plus Plus. What's the, tell us more about it. How did you end up in the position that you're in? What are you trying to focus on and achieve specifically with the conference? Yeah, so the conference actually started like, I think there's a couple things going on here. One is like, I want an opportunity to bring everyone who's been in um, Base 58, give them an opportunity to like come hang out together because it's an online class, right? So holding a conference is kind of a good opportunity to get everyone into the same space and like get to know each other, which I think is like super important. Another cool thing we wanted to do, I think there's two other things that we really want to do with Bitcoin plus plus. Um, the first one is we wanted front run consensus. So consensus is like this really big conference that I think Coindesk puts on every year. And it's pretty well known for being like what I would call kind of like a shit coin conference. Excuse me. Oh yeah, I'm allowed to cuss. This is fine. You know, having like this like big Bitcoin dev experience right for consensus, the idea or the hope is that we could get some people who maybe are coming in town for consensus that want to hear what's going on on the dev side at Bitcoin. We get all the smartest people I know of Bitcoin to come and give talks and hopefully we'll be able to like, I don't know, steal some people over from the dark side um, by providing them the opportunity sort of thing. And then the third thing that we really wanted to do with Bitcoin Plus Plus is like one of the things that Base58 really wants to do and I haven't been really good at like following this up, but like a really big thing, goal of ours is to like one, get a lot of people into Bitcoin really technically, learn a whole lot really quickly about how Bitcoin works technically. And then after they like learned all this stuff is figure out how to like let them stay in the space technically, which means either helping them find grant money to work on projects or finding them jobs as devs, right? So we've invited a bunch of all of our sponsors in order to sponsor the workshop portion of Bitcoin Plus Plus, one of our requirements is you either had to be like making something you wanted devs to build on top of hiring Bitcoin devs or giving out grants so that like, so the idea is like, we're going to have a dinner on the second night where everyone who's sponsored gets to pitch what they're like doing for like, you know, either hiring or like, we've got three, I think maybe four of our sponsors are like grant programs for open source people. So we've got, um, we've got Brink, we've got Super Lunar, which is Gemini's thing. And we've got Coinbase grants or Coinbase giving. Uh, and then Spiral, I think someone was just telling me Spiral, um, who's kind of one of Block's projects, is also looking to give out money to open source devs for stuff. So anyways, so like, yeah, so that's kind of like, there's a bunch of stuff going on with Bitcoin Plus Plus, but those are sort of, I think, like the, the themes of what we're like angling for all in one. I love it. I also forgot to mention that you were a speaker at Bitcoin 2022. 
I did a, did an amazing job. I really enjoyed the panels that you participated in. Tell me about what it. So what you you're one of the few people in the space that is uh, focusing on bringing more devs, as you said, into the Bitcoin ecosystem, into the Lightning ecosystem, and as you said, really empowering people to be able to use this skill set in order to engage with um, what Bitcoin can do. Do you, for, for Base58, are most of the people that you are uh, working with, do they have a background in Bitcoin or you know, and in Lightning previously, or are these people who are excited about the space, are software engineers, and then are uh, coming in sort of fresh? It kind of runs the gamut, honestly. Like I think 95% of the people that have come through are Bitcoiners. Like they're excited about Bitcoin. They love Bitcoin. Uh, maybe like 80, 70 to 80% of those are developers. So majority of them are like developers in other spaces though, right? So like they haven't done a whole lot in the Bitcoin space or like, you know, we've gotten some people that like did boot camps, but the boot camps they did were like learn how to write web apps, right? Or like, you know, we got one guy who came through who's been doing like FileMaker Pro stuff for like a long time kind of thing. So a lot of people with like technical backgrounds or like other kinds of stuff, but they like there's not really, as far as my understanding, and I think like they're, the only exception to this is Jimmy Song's class, which I took when I got started four years ago, which teaches you a lot of the fundamentals, but there's not a lot of education materials about exactly how like Bitcoin transactions like work, like what are all the parts, how they fit together, et cetera. Um, so we're really like filling a niche. So like, so like our class, like, I don't know, sometimes I get people on the internet who are like, why would you pay all this money to take base 58? Cause it's not the cheapest thing you could do. Um, we're also not the most expensive class. I think Jimmy like definitely beats us on like price, so to speak. Um, but like, you know, people are like, why would you pay like a couple thousand dollars to take this class? Like, isn't all this information like free and online? And the answer is like, so yeah, why are people coming through? People come through because like you actually learn the material when we do it. Um, I'm a really good teacher, not to brag, like all the course curriculum is stuff that like I basically like come up with myself. And the really cool thing about like when you come through base 58, sorry, this is not your question, but I'm gonna talk anyway. No, no, it's great, keep going. Yeah, yeah. So like the one of the really cool things about coming through base 58, especially if you're a developer or like um, I try, I like to think that like new devs can have like a good time, but I think the truth is you get a lot more out of it if like you're not learning if everything's not new. I think this is true of anything, right? You like come through and if it's all new material, it's like a lot. Um, whereas if you kind of are familiar with some of the basic concepts, there's less to learn, so it's less overwhelming. One of the things about coming through the class is that like the way that we teach you the things is like organized in such a way that by the time you get to the end of the class, you've learned way more than you realize. So like, I think that like the people who come through base 58, you've got like, one thing that I really like thinking about as an educator is like, kind of like, I call it like the on-ramp. So like how every, every lesson after the next one, right? Like you want to build like just incrementally so that by the time you've gotten like really far up the ramp or down the rabbit hole, depending on which direction you want your ramp to go. Um, but like at the end of it, you like kind of, because hopefully it's been such a gradual process, you don't realize how far you've gone. So like you go through base 58 and you come out and like to you, you're like, yeah, I know how like multi-sigs work. And I understand like the crypto behind like elliptic curves and like, yeah, of course, like this is how SegWit transactions are different than non-SegWit transactions. And I can write like a wrap SegWit, whatever, like no problem, but you don't realize like how like unique those skills are, right? Cause you just went through class and everyone's like, like, I explained it to you in like a very simple way. And you've like seen how all this stuff works hopefully and you've like done some of it yourself and as you get to the end you like come out and you're like hey like bitcoin no he's like easy peasy and then like i've had people that like go to like interviews afterwards and like yeah i just like ace the interview I'm, like of course you did you're like one of like you know one percent of like devs who work in bitcoin understand the stuff that we teach you in class Absolutely. like you don't really know that because like your first intro to like bitcoin dev has been through this class now you're like ready to go out in the world. So anyways, I'm like super excited about like, we've only done two classes, right? Like I think only about 30 people have gone through it. Maybe 20, 25 of those are actually devs. The rest of them are like VCs or like, mm -hmm. like product manager kind of people. So I'm really excited to see. And we're only like two weeks out from class, I think at this point from our second class. So I'm really excited to see like kind of how all these like super knowledgeable people where they end up in like six months, right? Like. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. 
man, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm like, man, like I should totally take this class. Yeah. I think, I, I think you, you, you were understated in what you've accomplished at, uh, at Blockstream. Um, I want to take a step back at a super high level and talk about sort of lightning, lightning implementations and the amazing stuff that you've done, the differences between some of the implementations, right? So for everybody listening, you know, you have Bitcoin core, which you can run on, um, you know, very low cost hardware. And that is the incredibly robust, um, system that basically powers the layer one of the Bitcoin network, validates transactions, uh, communicates node to node, and then you can build things that interact with that or on top of it. And we talk about layer two technologies and the lightning network is what's called a layer two technology. So um, there are multiple implementations of the lightning network. And, uh, you know, there's LND, there's C lightning, uh, there's a Claire, people are really excited about rust lightning, but, um, they all take slightly different approaches, but they they all follow the same basic building blocks, and they uh, they can communicate interchangeably. So if Chris is running an LND node uh, on top of Bitcoin Core, and I'm running an Eclair node, and Nifty is running a um, you know a C Lightning node, uh, CLN Core Lightning, yo, Core Lightning now. Core Lightning, oh shit. Yeah, name change. We like changed uh, it months ago. Yeah. All right, it's all right. CLN for short. I don't know. I love it. I love it. Okay. A, or a CLN node, uh, we can all basically still route transactions between yourselves and uh, communicate over the, the, the Lightning Network uh, and interact. And they all sort of focus on different, on slightly different things. And so um, can you go into um, what CLN focuses on and what CLN, um, how, how you approach development on um, in Lightning from the kind of CLN blockstream perspective versus perhaps LND or Eclair or Rust Lightning. Yeah, totally. Um, so Core Lightning is like, I don't know, we like to think of ourselves as the first implementation, but like at the reality is like, I think LND and Eclair were kind of being developed at the same time. So it's a little bit of a race to the start there. Um, but we like, so our lead dev, his name is Rusty Russell. He's been working on C and spec related things for decades at this point. Um, he got into Bitcoin, I have no idea, but pretty early um, and has been working on Core Lightning since I want to say almost like 2015, even though like the network didn't ship to like 2017. <laughs> so like, yeah, so I think some of the biggest differences is that we like really like programmed the spec. Um, so like one cool thing about Core Lightning is that when we add stuff to the spec or when you're like trying to add a new feature to how Core Lightning works, there's the way that our project is set up is that like we have to add it to the spec before we can add it to our project because our project so maybe we can talk about specs a little bit too, yes but yeah please please go into uh, what a spec is why it's important and how development happens in these types of environments yeah okay yeah so spec is like a written description of how the software should behave in certain situations so if you do x this must happen if you do y y must happen and so it's a very technical document they're not meant to be so like a, a spec, especially the lightning spec is not meant to be an easy thing to read as a human to figure out how lightning works. The point of the spec is to rigorously document the behavior and expectations of how two lightning nodes are gonna interact with each other. So we've gotten a lot of feedback that's like, hey, like spec dev is like really hard. Like it's hard to read the specs. I'm like, yes, that is how it's supposed to be. If you want to understand how lightning works, I think there's definitely like a gap. I mean, the Mastering Lightning book, I haven't read it, but I hear that's like kind of a, if you want to learn how lightning works, there's like other material that'll teach you how lightning works. But then if you want to like actually like program an implementation, this is like the almost machine code, but written in human language understanding of like, you must do this and then you have to do this and then X and then Y, right? So they're very technical documents. Um, so like, what Core Lightning does is we have this cool thing where we'll take that just, technical Part of the reason that, I, um, that the, the having specs are so important is because it then allows everyone to build more interesting stuff or stuff on top of that because they have this really clearly defined way of interacting. So it means that once you have this really defined spec that everyone or that a group of people have, have agreed on, it actually like rapidly accelerates development because otherwise, like if I was just, you know, building some lightning implementation, you know, out of my ass and then like you have yours, we would have to have this like weeks long conversation and I'd be like, well, when, when my node wants to achieve X result, I'm going to send you, uh, you know, a thing that says, 
uh, whatever, just some random string that I think is funny. And then you'd be like, oh, that's stupid. But OK, fine. I'm going to like write my I'm going to set up my node so that it will respond to that thing with this other parameter. And we'd have to agree all of that stuff, like hundreds, hundreds, thousands of specific things. So when you have a spec and we both agree to having this spec, I can do whatever I want on my node. You can do whatever you want on your node. And as long as they both follow this this previously agreed upon spec, uh, we can really rapidly develop new things. Is that, would you add anything to that or take that up? Yeah, I think that's totally true. I think the other cool thing, well, so one thing is like, once the spec is decided on, it's like easy to build on top of, you don't have to go talk to anyone else, right? Once the spec is made, like anyone can then go look at the spec and as long as they follow the spec, at least this is the promise, as long as you follow the spec, you can, it's like guaranteed to work with any other lightning implementation. So in some ways, having the spec process makes lightning way more decentralized, even than like core lightning or core, I'm sorry, core Bitcoin, right? Because there is no spec in the same way of like the core Bitcoin consensus stuff. Yeah. Fine, they're trying to solve kind of a totally different problem. And so like Bitcoin is like kind of a different beast in that way. But I think this is one of the genius things in like making spec happen and making sure that we write down exactly what we expect these nodes to say when they talk to each other was sort of the genius of Rusty. Rusty comes from, like, Rusty really understands the importance of, like, making decentralized projects, right? And Rusty was like, look, like, building on Lightning is going to be really important for the Bitcoin ecosystem. We want, we don't want one team building Lightning. We want as many teams as possible building Lightning. And we want them to be building Lightning collaboratively. Because if you have multiple teams building Lightning, if something happens, like, one team, for example. So for a while, there was a project called Ptarmigan that was based out of Japan. I don't know where they went. There's also, like, an Eclair implementation in Python, not Eclair. There's an Electrum implementation of Lightning, so to speak. Um, these guys, like, they don't, I don't know where they are. Like, they've kind of disappeared. I guess the reason I bring them up is, like, if some of these Lightning teams, like, don't, aren't able to survive, it makes, like, Lightning as an implementation and as a protocol a lot more likely to exist for, like, a long time because there's distributed, independent teams that understand how this protocol works by themselves and have separate funding and separate like ways that they're gonna continue to exist. So like the spec process is like the core way that these independent kind of groups are able to make sure that all their stuff works together and they're codified and will outlive any one team, right? So I think that's kind of like one of the cool things about the lightning spec process that as far as I'm concerned and no, doesn't really exist very many places outside of maybe like the web, like IC you know, like HTTP, TCP processes, right? Like, and you know, like there's separate browsers. It's really like, I feel like that's like, as far as I know, I think like the separate web browsers is as close of an analogy of another ecosystem doing the same thing as what Lightning is doing these days, which yeah. is cool and like absolutely fucking wild, right? Like, yeah, yeah that's, I hadn't thought about it that way. Would you yeah. say, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, like, you know, people think of like JavaScript, but really it's like ECMAScript. And then basically every browser has its own implementation that interacts with the web in the same way using this, like, again, this spec. spec and has. of course there's, go ahead. Yeah, but JavaScript also has a spec, right? That like exactly. everyone who writes it. Actually, I think that like at some level, like at some level when you think about it, I think there's really only like one JavaScript like interpreter that everyone reuses, right? There's like one, I think it's called V8. And it was like done by like the Google project. And like, yeah, yeah. It was, there wasn't originally, and there were like lots of different ones. And then so Google was, was like, like consolidated around one, right? Cause like the amount of like yeah. money and like energy that you need to put into this kind of infrastructure. Like we're talking about like at this point, like we're talking about infrastructure, right? Like these are like open source infrastructure projects that make like certain platforms run like the web like javascript makes the web run right v8 is like a very like difficult technical project that makes like the web work right yeah. and at some point yeah. like there wasn't enough funding for all those other javascript projects to like get the engineers they needed to compete with whatever the v8 team was doing right so in some extent v8 has become the de facto standard because they had all the money of google behind them at some point right yep. google's Wait, able one thing really quick we have in the comments people are asking how they can read up and learn about base 58 what's oh. the url yeah, it's base58.info. That's a really interesting analogy, though. Yeah, I mean, V8 is interesting. Uh, it's a bit of history. JavaScript was uh, much slower uh, than it is right now. And basically, Google was like, we're just going to spend tens of millions of dollars. And they just hired all the best PhDs. They rewrote the like everything from the ground up. 
created the V8 engine, which basically allowed Chrome to ascend and be the fastest browser that could do the most shit. And then it got abstracted off into a server-side framework, so you can write JavaScript on the front end and the back end. And then they open sourced it, and so then every you know, I think, I think most other browsers use the V8 yeah. uh, back end. Although Safari, right? right? Hmm? Safari is like the biggest, like you know, like all the mobile yeah. web apps use it. All the mobile web apps use it. It's like anytime you use like what's that like. I don't know, Slack is like written in this. I forget what it's called, but like it's like a wrapper. It's a JavaScript wrapper that you bundle up. I think it's up. called Electrum, actually. Is it Electrum? It, it's confusing because <laughs> Electrum is also a separate. Okay, yeah, that's why I was like, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's Electrum. VS Code, I think, also uses Electrum. Anyway, we're going down the rabbit hole, but let's let's pull, so let's pull back. So we were talking about specs, the importance of specs, and um... the importance of like the uh, diversity or distributed like implementation teams, right, of the spec are also really important and hard to keep going for a long time. So Lightning at this point has had like three teams, four now with Spiral on the scene. Um, Electron, not Electrum. Okay, so sorry. Ah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, um, okay. anyways, okay, so like, let's go back to like, so like Bitcoin is a distributed protocol, right? And like something about like keeping, you know, the way that distributed systems work is that there's like some inefficiency and like duplication across the ecosystem. Like everyone keeping a copy of the Bitcoin blockchain on their node, like that's what makes it distributed, right? That's also super like inefficient by whatever quality, like a certain, depending on how you think about efficiency, like having everyone validate the same goddamn transaction across like 5,000, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 Bitcoin nodes. I don't know how many there are these days, but like everyone getting the same transaction and verifying it is like dumb and inefficient to some extent, right? But that's what makes it like distributed and resilient is because you have that inefficiency in terms of like everyone doing the same work to validate it, but ver verifying on their own. So Lightning is distributed in the implementation team and like, yeah, in some ways that is like, inefficient because everyone has to re-implement all the stuff independently in their own like language stack. I think every implementation is in a different language too, which is kind of funny. Core Lightning is in mostly C, but we started getting some like plugin. So we have plugin architecture. This goes back into like how is Core Lightning different than the other implementations. Ours is more like um we try to be like our implementation really like we have these things called like plugins. So like and there's a lot of like so basically like the way a lightning node works is there's a lot of different parts and functionality and stuff. And so core lightning was written such that everything that you would need, we kind of like write an interface. So you try and expose as much of like the low level stuff as possible and then build like a nicer interface on top of that and make it such that if you wanted to, you can swap out that thing for something else. So a good example of how this works on core lightning or one way that we're taking advantage of it is um, there is a, you know, like, so Lightning is used to make payments, right? Like, my favorite way of talking about Lightning is Lightning is a payment rails technology. Like, it is a way of moving money from one person to another. It's really awesome because it's instant settlement. We should totally talk about how that's different from credit cards. That's fascinating to me. But, like, we can maybe loop back to that. But, so one thing that, like, every Lightning implementation has to do is pay an invoice, right? You send an invoice, you hit pay your lightning node will figure out how to route. So your, your lightning node, when it gets an invoice, it's gonna figure out how to route that through the lightning graph. You know, cause lightning isn't a direct thing. You have to hop from one person to the next. You like hopping along, whatever. And then you get to the final yep, destination. This giant spider web. And so yeah, if I exactly. have a node, Chris has a node, you have a node. And you know, we go out to lunch and you're like, oh, P, you owe me 10,000 sats. Uh, even if our nodes do not have a direct connection, a channel uh, between each other, you can, create an invoice, show it to me. I can scan it with my, uh, with my wallet or my node. And then my, uh, lightning implementation will figure out like, okay, what is the right route? And we'll bounce through Chris's node or whoever else, whichever can be the cheapest thing. And it's going to route it eventually to your node. And we'll be good to go. Exactly. Yeah. So it does right route finding, right? So there's this route finding algorithm. Like uh, it figures out where the path is and if there's liquidity, which means if there is stats that are available to flow towards you to make the payment, the routing algorithm is going to find them and send them to you, right? That's like the whole thing. So that's just like the, in Core Lightning, this is called the pay command. So you say pay, and then you give it a URL or like not a URL, you give it an invoice, it's a long stringy thing. And then it does all this in background, like magic stuff to figure out how to make, how to pay it, right? So that's all like in Core Lightning. But here's the cool thing about Core Lightning. That pay command is written as a plugin. 
everyone gets it. Oh, that's so fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. Anytime you like get Core Lightning, you download and install it, you have the pay command. But pay command is written in such a way that it's like kind of this like layer above the actual core node. And so you can swap it out with a core lightning node. Yeah, you can swap it out. So Rusty, who's like our, our lead dev and like probably one of the most brilliant computer programmers alive today, not even joking. Um, he has been working on implementing this new routing algorithm that Renee Pickard has been working on for years. Um, using this like intuition or like insight that Renee had about the problem you're trying to solve when you pay a lightning invoice has a name in computer science. It's called the min cost flow algorithm. It's just like, you know, like in one thing that I learned, I learned computer science later in life. So like, I always have like interesting ways of explaining what all these things are like, man, it took me forever. This is like sort of a little bit of like, whatever, but figuring out what the hell people were talking about and said algorithm was like a whole adventure. Like took me years to figure out what the heck anyone was talking about. Wait, so what is your definition of an algorithm? Yeah, yeah. It's a, an algorithm is like a, it's kind of like a recipe or like a series of steps you take to solve a problem. That's like literally it. That's exactly like, how I would define it. It's like like when people think of a when I used to, you know, to teach software engineering, it was like a cookbook is just a set of algorithms. It's like oh, you have your and it's it's like the format is beautiful. You have your inputs and then you have your output, and it's like you have like raw chicken, a bunch of spices, and a bunch of random shit, and then the output is going to be like a roast chicken that tastes amazing, and then the set of instructions that it's like do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. In what order, when, with what ingredients, at what time is the algorithm? Exactly, that's perfect. Yeah, except in computer science stuff projects, the recipe is dealing with something that we call data, which is your inputs, right? And your outputs is usually like a result or like an which item, or maybe it's an ordering of those data items. Like every algorithm produces a different thing using the data that you put in the top. Or in like lightning, it's like, which path do I take? Here's all the paths you could take. Which path should I take of all the paths? And so then you have this like process of, a, so the algorithm in cost flow algorithm is a stated little like process of how you evaluate every option of which route to take and so it sorts through all the options of how you know it's like a graph there's like a bunch of different ways you could get to it's like a street graph of like of a city right and it's like how do I get from my house to grandma's there's like you take the highway you take back roads you could take the highway and the back roads you could like take the tollway but that's going to cost you like five bucks like what are you optimizing for there's going to be traffic here like what's the traffic thing right so there's like a lot of things that go into like this route finding problem it's the same for lightning um so then there's like this like process. So you look at all the options, like highway, freeway, like toll road, back roads, how much traffic, you know? And so then your algorithm, the min cost flow thing takes all these like inputs, like information, what's the traffic like? How many different paths are there? Like, is it a freeway or is it a whatever? And it takes all this information, right? And it uses like, I don't know what min cost flow is, but I don't know exactly what that is, but like it basically uses these like decision makes a decision at every point, right? About each of these different paths. And then at the end of it, the end of this algorithm of considering all these different things is it says, this is the path that you should use, you know? And that's like the output, right? Of the algorithm It's like this path, try this one. Um, or maybe it's like a little more complicated and then it redoes it, retries, right? If that fails, you do it again and find the next one to try kind of thing. Um, anyways, that's the min cost flow algorithm. Bring that back to how like core lightning plugins work. <laughs> so the cool thing about the fact that we can swap out, we can swap out. So now Rusty is writing a second plugin that will do a new command. Plugins can add commands to core lightning. So you can write your own plugin that adds a new command to core lightning that you can then execute. And so Rusty is writing a new plugin with a new command called Renee Pay after Renee Pickhart, who's main cost flow this is. So now when you run Core Lightning or when whenever he gets it done and we ship it, which hopefully will be in our next release, um, you'll be able to call Renee Pay and give it your invoice. And it'll use this new, totally different routing algorithm logic, which should be really good at making it good and efficient at paying larger invoices is the whole concept. So it should be really, really fast and quick. But it's super cool because it's modular. So our ability to add that in is like kind of this nice on top layer thing because Core Lightning as the, the underlayer exposes all the like little like 
APIs you need to rewrite new new algorithms for how to find paths and pay invoices in Lightning really easily. So as an example, uh, there's been another team, Karsten Otto, who runs l and stuff and writes a lot of Java. He's written a separate independent application for l and So you can use Rene Pay on l and but you have to download and run his, I don't exactly know how that works on l and I've never done it, but I think it's like a separate application and it runs in Java. Yep, and so exactly. you have to, like, it's a little more, it's not like built in. And I don't think it's a lot harder, I think, to bake in. Like, I don't know what the L&D team will have to do to make it such that that's like an option that you can use more defaulty instead of having to download and run a Java application that does it. So. Yeah, that's that's such a good point. And, and just just to reiterate, what you're talking about is in, in for example, LND, which is another popular Lightning implementation, um, in order to use like the routing algorithm that your node uses to find routes, payment routes, through this gigantic spider web that is the Lightning Network is a super important algorithm because it defines how efficiently your node is going to be able to send payments through the network. So that's like this very, very core functionality. And it's actually a really challenging uh, computer science problem. It's kind of, um, I think it's technically an, like a uh, traveling salesman problem, right? Yeah, which is NP complete, I think. Again, yeah, like, yeah. So I, was, I came to computer science really late in life, sort of. Like I started getting into it, when I was like 24 or so. So like- That's not late. Yeah, but like it's, you know, whatever. Um, but so like, so this is what I've got up on my screen. This is a, a, a simplification of the Lightning Network. I actually had to, this is a fantastic website uh, for everyone who's listening, uh, lnrouter.app. has It's a ton of amazing tools. Um, I use it all the time. But this is, so I, <laughs> there were too many channels and it was slowing down my computer. So I had to uh, change the filter. So it's only showing nodes in the Lightning Network that have four or more channels. And then uh, I searched for uh, Aaron Malone's node, Darth Node, she's one of the people that uh, created Plebnet. And you can see this is every, the pink is every single channel. Oh, it went away. But it was every single channel that her Lightning node is uh, has open and all the different nodes that she's connected to. And you can see this gigantic spider web. And that's, you know, this is a visual representation of the Lightning Network. So when we're talking about routing payments, uh, you know, this node, Darth Node, can route directly to all these different nodes that it's connected to. But that's not all it can do. Payments can be bounced and are bounced constantly through every single node in the network as it is efficient and, and uh, economically viable to do so. So what we're talking about is the algorithm, again, that decides how to actually route those payments through. And what uh, Lisa's talking about is, and I didn't know this, that in, C, in CLN, it's gonna take me a while to remember that name, the algorithm itself is something that is based and implemented as part of a plugin architecture, which is to say you can customize that algorithm. So if you want to optimize the way that your node or that a node finds a route through this gigantic spider web, you can do that very, very efficiently, very easily using C Lightning. And that's a difference and an important distinction between L and D, which has this baked in in sort of this monolithic approach. And so in order to use alternative algorithms, you have to go through a lot more. It's not as efficient and uh, it's harder to build on top of. Yeah, at least that's my understanding of it. Again, I haven't tried building on top of LND. So like to a certain extent, I'm like, this is what I've seen happening at least with this particular algorithm, right? So you can kind of compare how Rusty's going about it versus how Karsten Otto has been building it, I think, yeah. Yeah, man, this is such a great graph. Like, wow, it really does look like a Starfleet or something of nodes, like all connected to each other, which is super fun. Yeah. yeah. I, I know I saw this BTC session showed this like months ago that I saw it on either Why Are We Bullish or something like that. Lisa, I, I really appreciate your definition of an algorithm. Uh, I'm an engineer by degree, a chemical engineer. Uh, so I understand civil engineering and mechanical engineering. I have a bunch of friends that I make fun of uh, for, for being that. Uh, I say it's easier, but I have a lot of respect for electrical engineers or computer science because it's not my strong suit. I, I think what you guys do is normally magic. So I really appreciate that definition of an algorithm being like a recipe is something easy for, for even me to understand, basically. The plugin architecture that CLN uses is, I would say, one of its distinguishing features. Would you agree? Yeah, I think that's true. I don't think there is. Can you guys hear me? Oh, my, yeah, yeah, uh, we can be great. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's definitely one of our big advantages. At least as like a developer, it's one of my favorite things because it makes it, if I want to 
do something with Core Lightning, I can write a plugin and it'll like, you know, customize it. So it's a little more customizable is the idea. Um, yeah, I think for a long time though, and one of the reasons that LND I think got so much market share was that they had, they were much better, I think, at exposing your app or your Lightning Node functionality and like basically the API, so calling the pay command over like HTTP, so to speak. And they did that with something called like gRPC, which is like this Google protocol thing that makes it really easy for someone to write an app in any language they want that can call your Lightning node and talk to your Lightning node, even if your Lightning node's in like a totally different like computer or data center or country. And it does that all over like normal, what we call like HTTP communication, right? Maybe not exactly HTTP, I might like have that a little wrong, but it's like basically over like normal webby, webby, webby technology, right? Um, whereas Core Lightning didn't have a way that was built in and shipped with the application, like shipped with the Core Lightning node that you could easily talk to. You could easily call like pay an invoice for a Core Lightning node that you run, right? Anywhere in the world, you'd have to do a lot of kind of like custom little work to like make it, expose it to like, remote stuff from like a website or like a different computer somewhere else in the world. Like Core Lightning was really like Unix based, which assumed like if you have something running on the same computer, it's really easy to do that. But that's like not very useful if you like want to have like a mobile application that's like on your phone that then talks to your own personal Lightning node, right? Um, so Core Lightning made it really hard or like not easy. Like there was no standard, there was no standard way to talk to Core Lightning from like a TCP connection, so to speak. Um, yeah, so our last release, we did our first like gRPC, we like kind of caught, not copied, but we definitely copied what LND was doing with gRPC <laughs> by adding a gRPC thing. Though Notation our, is the sincerest form of flattery. Yeah, I, yeah, it's very flattering. People really liked it and they told us we needed it. So we added it. Um, apparently there's a little hiccups, a couple hiccups in there. Um, I think like so everything that was implemented this is maybe a little too much information but whatever everything that was implemented all of our commands so like pay as a command for core lightning all of our commands that were implemented as plugins which is pay and another one is like open channel all of these commands that are in plugins didn't make it into the gRPC because of the way that the, the engineer that made the gRPC added the commands to the gRPC oh interesting so it's kind of funny, I was talking to someone, I was in Oslo a few weeks ago for the Human Rights Foundation, had this really amazing conference, the Freedom Forum in Oslo two weeks ago. And I, it was a great opportunity to meet a lot of the Ellen Bits team. They're working out of, I think most of them are Europe based. A lot of them seem like they were from Berlin. Uh, so I got to meet a whole bunch of these guys who were like building on top of lightning, doing really cool stuff. I was talking to the guy who's trying to make like the piece of software that uses the gRPC for core lightning and then makes it the Ellen bits API on top of that. So you can seamlessly call an Ellen bits thing and it'll translate it to whatever the core lightning is or LND is so like kind of this nice, like, Oh yeah, that's cool. Unification thing. And he was like, Lisa, I can't, can't invoice and I can't open a channel with your gRPC. And I was like, Whoa, what's weird. And I started thinking about it. I was like, Oh, cause we've implemented all of those as plugins and like our automated thing to make the gRPC bindings isn't, doesn't, take plugins into account right now anyways it's kind of funny oh that's so like, interesting yeah it was really funny i was like oh it's a big whoops like we'll fix it in our next release which should be sometime in july so we're coming up but on that but that's the beauty of 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 what, what we're building and what you guys are building it's like you have these interactions you learn you figure out these new things these breakages and then you're able to go and with a clearly defined spec and everything in place you yeah. can just go and you can you can create those systems that fix this minor issue yeah we're gonna fix it it'll be fine yeah, yeah, yeah of course funny. it was funny he was like, hey, you can't like open a channel with your gRPC. I was like, oh, we should, we should fix that. It's like, it's like two core things you want to do when you have a lightning node. You want to make a payment, you want to open a new channel. Like, And, and again, I, I also want to stress for everyone that's listening, we're talking about some of the, the deep, deep nuts and bolts aspects of um, the core lightning of, implementation. Yeah. Of the core lightning implementation. But you don't have to know any of this stuff. You don't have to care if you don't want to. You can literally go download a wallet, um, Right now, you can. One of my favorites for this is uh, Moon Wallet. That's M U U N. There's Blixed Wallet. There's, uh, you know, Blue Wallet. There's all these different wallets that you can use as an individual who knows nothing about computer science to send Bitcoin via the Lightning Network, uh, essentially instantaneously for very, very low fees today. So you don't have to know any of this stuff if you don't want to. We're talking about it because we find it's that it's interesting and it's 
something that is important for the Lightning Network, but uh, don't let this scare you away if you don't know what we're talking about. Um, Lisa, I, w- I wanna I wanna shift slightly. What are some of the things that the the developments that are being worked on in the Lightning Network that you are personally the most excited about right now? Oh man, oh man. Okay, there's like there's a couple, but like so my my thing that like I've been working in Lightning for a couple years now. The project I've been working on for a long time is something called liquidity ads. We shipped it last fall. It's been wait, out wait, the world. wait. You got to give us a definition of liquidity ads. Uh, yeah. So basically, this is a way that if you run a Lightning node and you have, let's say, like a bunch of Bitcoin that you want to put into Lightning channels, and actually, yeah, you want to put it into Lightning channel. You can. There's there's really one way to do that before liquidity ads. I'm gonna like make whatever. I'm gonna tell history how I want it to sound. Um, Absolutely, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way that you would do it before the liquidity ad thing that we shipped on Core Lightning last fall is you would have to open a channel. So let's say I've got like half a Bitcoin that I want to put into a Lightning channel. I'd have to pick which node I want to open that to, and that takes a little bit of effort, right? Because you want to put, you know having this like this like half a bitcoin you call that like your liquidity right or whatever um when you put it into a channel then the way that you earn money costs you money to open a channel once you have to open you have to pay it's an on-chain fee there's a fee to open a channel and you pay that to the miners of bitcoin that's like on-chain right and then whenever anyone routes a payment hopefully you've put this half a Bitcoin in the right place to the right But it could right be any amount. Node. It doesn't have to be half a Bitcoin, just to make that clear. Yeah, no, no, no. This is like, all right, maybe it's like, I don't know what, a uh, hundred million sets. I could always like-, like Well, you could do it. You can open a channel for any size, channel. right? So like, you know- when There's I was like fr- definitely a lower limit, but it's well, there like is, a I mean, 50 to 60,000 sat range, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, when I was first learning, I went through the process and I was like, all right, I'm going to open a- uh, uh, I was opening a hundred thousand sat channels and I was like, Oh, that was a fucking mistake because I couldn't route that much liquidity. So through the network, because again, the way the lightning network works is you have a node, there's another node. And then in order to be able to route payments, you have to have what's called a channel. And a channel is just a multi-sig contract between two different nodes that allows liquidity to be routed. It's like almost like a, this is a terrible analogy, but it's kind of like a bar tab. So if Lisa and I have uh, a channel between our two nodes, then uh, let's say that we open it, uh, you know, let's, for simplification, we'll say it's a dual funded channel. And by the way, anything that I say that you're like, oh, that's stupid, please jump in and tell me I'm, I'm an idiot. Uh, but like, let's say that we have liquidity, it's like, that's balanced between us. So we have this 100,000 sat channel. If there's 50,000 sats on my side, 50,000 sats on your side, then if we go out to beers and I owe you, uh, let's say the beer in this magical hyper <laughs> hyper Bitcoinized world, each beer is five sats, uh, then essentially you can, if I owe you five sats, I can, I can send that through our channel, send it. And what that does is it updates this sort of bar tab between us. And then at any point in the future, we can like close out or sell that bar tab make another on-chain transaction, and then whatever is on either side of this channel will be sort of settled into an on-chain transaction onto our node. Yep, that's right. And, yeah. and so what, what the issue that I had when I was first starting is I had to, I, you know, I opened all these what are relatively very small size channels, 100,000 sats, and then very quickly it was like, oh, shit, I fucked it up because that's a small amount. So in each of those channels, I could only, let's say I open the channel to you and there's 100,000 sats on my side, so different than the scenario I just laid out where we magically have a balance channel, uh, I could only send you 100,000 sats. And then that was it. I'd maxed out that channel and I had to, I would have to find another route in order to get that payment to you. And so the only way to solve that problem is I'd have to make another on-chain transaction, close out that channel that was too small, and then open another one. Two make, on-chain transactions. Yeah, yeah, two, exactly. Then I'd open a larger one that was, let's say, I'm like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to go with 500,000 sats. And then I quickly learned, I was like, that's not even big enough. Now we're doing a million sats. And every time I do that, I have to do two more on-chain transactions, which um, in this low-fee environment, eh, but we're not going to be in that forever. So liquidity ads solve this problem. Is that correct? Uh, liquidity ads is a different way of deploying your Bitcoin to okay. Lightning. So what we've been talking about is like, I've got like some Bitcoin, I don't know, a million sats. I have to make a decision about where to put it onto the network, right? Like, am I opening a channel to P? Am I opening a channel to Chris? 
who of these two like is the better option to like put it on because like you're saying you really want someone the way you like offset those on chain fees in the old model in this model with like i opening the channel is that payments get routed every time a payment gets routed i get earn a little bit of fees but not on chain fees it's slightly different um anyways so like you like earn a little bit, right? So like, you're kind of like making this bet when you open a channel that the amount of fees you make routing those stats to the other side is gonna be more than however much you end up paying in on-chain fees. Right? Anyways, you gotta make like, you gotta make a decision, right? Okay, so what we did with liquidity ads is we made up with like, kind of like change the question. And like, okay, like, let's say you've got like a million stats that you wanna put into a channel. Instead of you making a decision about where to put it in the network by using things like ellenrouter.app or Amboss, he has some data. I think Ellen Router has like better data about how to like decide who to make a channel with. But instead of like having you make up a decision as the owner of like, I don't know, a million sets, instead of having you make up a decision about where you're gonna put it and pay chain and fees for and then hope that it like gets routed so you can kind of earn your money, you know, don't lose money opening that channel. Um, Liquidity ads makes that such that you can just advertise. The ad part stands for advertisement of Bitcoin that you want to put into a channel. And then anyone who like needs to be able to receive lightning payments needs money kind of on the, um, they kind of need money pointed at them. So they need money. So if you want to receive a payment on lightning, you need someone that's got Bitcoin to put it in a channel pointed at you, right? So liquidity ads is a way that I can advertise. I have, I have Bitcoin available to put in a channel pointed at you, but the advertisement part is it's like here's how much I want you to pay me, as a benefit of making it such that you can receive a lightning payment using this like Bitcoin capital that I've got, right? So liquidity ads makes it such that like, you P can ask me Lisa to put a million sats into a channel that we both share with that million sats like pointed and you're basically like available for you to receive a million sats worth of payments or to route a million sats worth of payments right out the other side. Um, and you basically pay me for that, like for having that million sats available to you. And part of the, the advert, like part of this spec, so this is a spec, like I wrote a spec and we implemented it in Core Lightning. And Part of it is that we actually make it such that like, if you pay me for this million sats and I, I like publish my rate, like I went 10 basis points or whatever. Um, I make eyes, the seller make you two guarantees when you buy it from me. First guarantee I make you is that I'm not able to reuse that liquidity anywhere else until a month has passed. Like fourth, it's in blocks, like 4,000 blocks, which is about a month. So you have, you like, when you pay me, you're paying me for the right to use that liquidity that liquidity for that whole month and if i close the channel before it ends it's going to be time locked so i'm not going to be able to get it out so it's in my benefit to keep that channel open because every time i route a payment towards you so you know as the seller of the liquidity or of the funds right into this channel that we've got with you you're going to pay me for that you're also going to pay some of my on-chain costs so like i don't pay as much to deploy that bitcoin to the lightning network you as the buyer are going to pay for it and this is all part of the liquidity ads like spec thing um, you're also, because you've opened the channel now, you're also going to pay the fees to close the channel. So that's not going to be my cost as the person with the million sats. I don't have to worry about the closing fees anymore because you're going to pay for those. Um, and then I also am going to get paid every time a payment routes through the, through me to send that million sats to you. Every time a payment uses that, that sats, I also get paid again. So it's like a really, like, you know, people talk about trying to like, earn yield with Bitcoin, liquidity ads are a really brilliant way of being able to, one, control the on-chain cost of deploying capital, two, making it such that the only people that are like buying your capital are ones that like have a, a financial incentive to receive payments, right? So it's like worth it to them to put up the money to get that capital in their direction, right? I mean, I, I don't know, there might be non-rational, non, what's the word for like, whenever you're concerned about your economic rational, economically rational, non-economically rational people might buy it, but over time, the only people that will be buying liquidity are ones who have a need to receive payments over lightning, right? So like there's a pretty strong, it should be in theory, a pretty strong signal 
that that capital that you've allocated Lightning Network is going to get used because the person is like coughed up money in order to like get it, if that makes sense. So like, yeah. you can like, so like liquidity ads are like awesome. Um, because like one, like as a seller of, of Bitcoin, like capacity, increases the yield that you can make on. Yeah. And part Bitcoin. of the way that, and it took me a while. I didn't really understand this when we wrote it. It was kind of like a happy accident, but like, because of the way the liquidity ads changes how a channel is opened and makes it such that the person who's not the opener can put money into the channel. So that's like me. So P would open the channel. And when you request the open channel, you tell me how much capital you want me to put into it because I'm not the opener. My on-chain fee cost is very like easy to calculate and fixed and doesn't mm -hmm. like, because the opener of a channel is responsible for the closed fees, which might be anything. But since I didn't open the channel, I don't have to use, I don't have to figure out how much this channel is going to cost me in on-chain fees. So yeah. I can like very easily figure out what my profit loss is going to be from selling liquidity on liquidity ads in a way that no other channel like selling protocol, there's a couple other ones that all require the person who's selling, who's like selling it to be the opener, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, and just to put a bow on it, the the thing that is so that to me was so compelling about the Lightning Network when I first started playing around with it, we started you know uh, set up a node. Is it's this? It's like the most exciting real time strategy game I've ever played. Like I used to love playing StarCraft, right? And StarCraft and many games like it are really resource allocation games, right? And you have to know how to time things correctly, when to take certain actions, and when not to take certain actions. And the Lightning Network is an incentives based system that drives towards certain outcomes those outcomes being the things that benefit you as an individual node benefit the entire network and so what what you're talking about is or let's say 99 percent of the time the majority of actions right and so the thing that you're talking about is a really brilliant way to create certain economic incentives that will help people ma manage their liquidity which ultimately is one of the largest problems or it's the cha it's the largest challenge uh, when you're running a lightning node. And if you're a large entity or if you're an individual, you have to really be thinking about how your on-chain costs, how much you're making in the, the fees that you're you're collecting, and then making sure that that is ultimately a profit profitable endeavor. And so what you've done is you've created this system that really gives another tool in this toolkit for people to be able to more effectively manage their liquidity, which in turn increases the, uh, the amount of liquidity in the network and allows that lightning network to grow more rapidly. And hopefully it makes payments more reliable. Absolutely. Because That's another the, the, actual, the available Bitcoin that wants to get locked into Lightning channels has some better signals about where to put it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But like, and, and I'm seeing the chat, like people are kind of like, oh, wow, I didn't thought about it that way. The It really is a real-time strategy game. Like it is, in, it is so much fun. And there are so many different nuances and there's so many different strategies that you can use and, you know, connecting to different types of nodes, whether it's a, uh, you know, like a, a node that is going to push liquidity to you or whether it's a node that's going to suck liquidity from you and then setting up uh, channels and structures such that that is economically beneficial for you. And then there's also like the reason we started Plevnet was because we wanted to sort of be learning all this in this large group of friends. And so, you know, we would have these sort of out of band conversations where I'd be like, all right, you got to promise me though, if I open this note, this channel to you, you're not going to fuck me, right? You're not going to like take all the liquidity and then just like close it out. And then some people in the network got known as people that would just like do that. And what you're talking about is it's a protocol level, uh, maybe that's the wrong word, but basically these, these commitments are actually coded into the, the transactions on chain, on -chain transactions yeah so and when so the it, channel closes if you've promised that liquidity to that peer if you close the channel like they won't be able to use it but you won't either because it's locked into that it'll be locked on chain there's a time lock that doesn't expire until that deadline that you both agreed on when they paid you and i love this because it removes that that requirement for trust right whereas like i had to be like you know lisa all right you're not gonna fuck me, right? Now we can have this this type of the more of these types of um, of transactions where it's simply it's simply just part of the transaction. It's a you can't get around it, and I think that's we're both incentivized to keep that open. Exactly. Right? 
And like, look, man, like, I mean, here's one thing about these like contracts that for a while I've kind of like not so sure about the time requirement on them because if you are like, I don't know, like the Walmart of lightning and you're receiving like millions of sets of payments every minute, right? Like if I sell you the liquidity and like you use it in the first five minutes, right? Like you receive a million sets of payments in the first five minutes, like it doesn't matter if we like close the channel, right? Like it's like at that point, we can close the channel, but there's not like my, there's, I don't have anything in that channel anymore. So I don't really care if you close it. Right. Cause you're going to like lock out like none of my money kind of thing. So I don't know. There's some interesting stuff there. There's, I know it's like almost, an, it's almost been like an hour, but I've got like, there's like two, three other things. Well, two other things that I'm excited about Yeah, like, hit it. Three, that I want to talk about. So it's all liquidity stuff. This is like kind of been like, I guess unintentionally sort of the thing that I've spent a lot, most of my career in lightning these days, like working on is like, um, kind of like node ops around like where your money is. Um, so there's there's two projects. So one of the projects that I finished up liquidity ads last fall. And since then I've been working on getting really better bookkeeping for Core Lightning as a plugin that will like every time you send and receive or like have on-chain fees or like earn routing stuff, like now we're collecting it at like this millisat level that no other lightning node as far as I'm concerned um, is doing. So I've been running it on my node for a while. I haven't done a lot with it because I'm like lazy. We've got a couple of things. I'm like cleaning up some reports and stuff. It'll give you like a CSV report of all your like money you've earned, money you've lost. And it like, you can print it out in a format. You can automatically upload it to like Cointracker or Coinly. So all of a sudden you can get like millisat level data about where all the money on your node is going. Holy shit. It's going to be great. It's like very, very close to being done. Hopefully it'll be out in our next release in July. I just gotta stop running conferences and stuff. <laughs> um, so that's like really exciting because now like all this stuff, like so now like when you deploy capital, you'll be able to see how much you're earning from selling like these liquidity ads. Like we have that built in. It'll tell you how much you're earning. We'll tell you how much the liquidity in your channel got used. So if like I send you a payment and then you send me a payment back and then I send you the same thing, that's like hundred sats that we send back and forth. I can tell you like how many times you reuse that same capital in channels. So you can get a good idea of which channels are actually like sending payments in which direction, right? So payments that like, you really want channels where the payments are going like both directions, right? Yeah. Cause then you get paid however many extra times, every time I send you money, I get paid, right? In theory, assuming I'm charging fees to send you money. So you really like, it'll give you like a much better picture. And all of a sudden you'll have this like really standardized data about every movement such that people can start building tools and analytics on top of the data that's coming out of your core lightning nodes. So I'm like super excited about this. I think it's gonna change the game in terms of people's ability to make better decisions about where to put their capital and how they deploy it, et cetera. Hopefully like, Anyways, yeah. Other Very things, cool. yeah. Other thing I'm really excited about is this project called Splicing, which builds on a lot of the work that we did in order to make liquidity ads happen. Um, we've got this awesome contributor called Dustin or Dusty, who's been working on this for the last couple of months with me. We've been, I've been helping him a lot figure out where and what parts to do. He's been doing all the work to actually make it happen. But basically, what Splicing is is it's basically it lets you modify so earlier we talked about when you wanted to like close a channel and then reopen it if you wanted to like let's say like we had a million sat channel and i put a million sats in it and it had like p had just been like selling all these like i don't know donuts in real life and so he's sold Which a million sats worth of donuts and so like all the payments have flowed to p and so the million sats i put in the channel is now on p side because he's like received a million sats worth of like lightning payments right so for me like this channel's like kind of dead but what if P could like, we could talk or maybe there's like some way we can like, I don't know, this is like, whatever. There's some way that P could convince me to put more Bitcoin in this channel such that with one transaction, so instead of having to close it and reopen it with another million sats in it, um, what if I could just use one transaction and add a million sats and at the same time, P takes that other million sats out of the channel and moves it to somewhere else or maybe to cold storage or something. You can do this all in one transaction That's so huge. that you can change, update the balance in a lightning channel, the funds, change the funds in a channel. Both of you get to decide at the same time if you want to take money out or put more money in or like whatever in one transaction. So instead of having to like close and then reopen a channel, now you can do it like in once. So you save on on-chain fees. It makes your liquidity a lot more flexible because you can kind of real time, real allocate it. 
cool thing about the protocol too is you can do a splice across two channels at the same time no one shit take, yeah yeah if you wanted to take liquidity out of one channel and move it into another you can do that in one transaction That's and they wild. look like coin joins because you're like doing there's actually like three so if you do that with two channels that's three parties they're in the channel so like Suddenly you get like, oh, you know, wow, you can increase the privacy of the channels. Yeah, that like you can have that have multiple parties the interacting in them. Right. So like you got like a lot better in theory, you get better like you check so privacy because you're breaking heuristics um, to some extent. And now your lightning balances, like if I wanted to make an on-chain payment out of a lightning channel and not close the channel, you can do that using a swipe. So I could pay like, I pay someone 50,000 sats out of a channel with one transaction transaction the channel stays in operation while it's happening while that channel is while that transaction is getting confirmed so you can still make payments through the channel and like the um that's fucking huge and yeah so like all of a sudden it makes this like i want a lightning balance and i want to have like one number and you can have all your money in channels and if you and like and then you get the benefit of being able and, to you can still advertise your liquidity ad stuff, even though all your money is allocated to channels, so that when a request for liquidity comes in from like you a can then splice it out if you ad, need to. You could splice it out of a channel that's not hurting you as much and open a new channel all in the same transaction. Wow, man, this is so exciting! God, splicing has been like the Shangri La for me of like the Lightning Network, and it's it's all people are always like, "What if I want to add liquidity?" And it's like, "It's coming! It's coming! One day! One day!" soon tm oh man it's like dustin did the first main chain slice it's like super hacky version you know like kind of like hacked it together to make it work it's not like it's not we're not dustin is ready but we're getting there and it's coming it's going to be sooner than i think anyone expects and also oh, i so think exciting. it's going to be i think it's going to change i think it's blow people's minds like it's definitely going to it's going to change the dynamics of the lay network in terms of what yeah. is economically possible and the cool thing is like like there's like you can kind of we haven't like spec this out yet there's definitely an opportunity to reuse liquidity ads here so like like liquidity ads right now are just when you're like trying to open negotiate a new channel with someone Maybe you don't but have if to you're adding in splicing, then if you wanted to like more nuance. pay someone to add more stuff into a channel, you could like use a liquidity ad to some extent. I don't know exactly how that would work, hand wave, but like you could definitely like reuse liquidity ad, right? So, like ask your peer, like, hey, yo, I need like more liquidity. Like, I will, you got it up, I will pay you. Like, figure out how to splice some more into this channel so I can get more payments. And like they on their end might like splice it out of other channels, right? And into you, because that's like where it works or whatever. Uh, that's um, so interesting. Yeah, so like, yeah. Wow. There's this really cool opportunity for like reconfigurable, like availability of Bitcoin. Okay, so here's what I wanna do. When this launches, I wanna get you, Dustin, a few other people, and then live, I wanna like do some of this stuff, go through the commands and show everybody exactly how it works. Cool, sounds That'd great. that be so much fun. Yeah, you can do like, yeah. Oh, Dustin I and it. I have been joking that like you could like you know how like football players have like the like plays or like names like the double whatever back or like the I don't know blue forty two like I don't I don't know like yeah. you know they like have like the things and they call them different names we should like come up with like you know do different ones for like splice plays where you like absolutely slice out like you know fifty sets and like move it over here and call it like I don't know the double Dutch like fifty five or something. And you know, like, okay, I'm gonna like execute a double dutch 55 with like channel peer, whatever. Yeah, lightning playbook. But like now you can like how you reconfigure your like splice up. It's just like, oh man. Thing. Like, yeah. All right. I'm gonna have to spin up. Here. I'm gonna have to spin up my, another uh, CLN node. Yeah. Poor <sighs> thing, yeah. I'm gonna be bugging you later. I'm gonna be bugging you. All right. We're, we're just about out of time. Uh, we're actually, wow, we're 13 minutes over. What, so you, you, this was one of the two things you were super excited about. Yeah. The what other the thing other is the thing that I came up with, introduced to the spec meetings. We had a big spec meeting last week. I don't think, we don't really talk about spec meetings before they happen. After they happen, we kind of talk about it more. Um, I have this like really brilliant idea based off a suggestion from Clara Shekelman um, about how we can change how nodes price their existing liquidity in their channels. Um, which I don't, I'm not going to, I think like someone put a, someone put a Zeman had a post on the mailing list, which like explained it, but it's like a really long post, kind of hard to read. Um, so I'm going to think I'm going to give a talk on it at Bitcoin plus plus tomorrow. So 
I'm not really going to like, this is like, I'm just going to tease it. You know, sorry, all you people who can't make it to Bitcoin plus plus tune in for the, I don't know if we're going to live stream it, but like we'll have a recording or I'm going to explain this like new proposal. And like, we talked about it at the spec meeting, everyone, there was, everyone's like pretty much excited about it. We're going to experiment with it on core lightning first, I think, um, working on writing a spec, but that should, it should be super simple to add. And it's going to like totally change the game of how lightning rebalancing works. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we haven't even talked about that in this conversation, at least for the for the for everyone else. But rebalancing is like how you maintain the liquidity so that it's balanced or optimized for the types of transactions that are happening across your channels. Because as as Lisa was saying, like if I am selling donuts, then eventually the channels that are open to me, so that liquidity can come in, will be maxed out on my side. And so there's just, there's this uh, operation that you have to do which is called a rebalance where you basically send sats out on one of those unbalanced channels and then you receive it back through uh, an oppositely unbalanced channel and that sort of like rebalances so that sats can be synced. But, but it's, it's an expensive process potentially yeah. and it doesn't always achieve what you want. In fact, one of my co-workers, Christian Decker, has done a lot of thinking about this and it's like rebalancing doesn't ever really achieve what you want. Like it's not... Yeah, you're just basically ever mm -hmm. worth it really so we came up with this really cool and exciting thing which i don't want to like it's gonna take me like another 20 minutes to talk about i really need to like go you gotta you gotta you gotta get ready for so, your conference yeah we're like opening registration in like an hour so we gotta show. Like, yeah yeah anyways but i'm super excited about it it's gonna change the game we should definitely talk about it at some point because it's gonna be it's gonna be sick like it's just it's just lightning's gonna be a totally different beast payments are hopefully just gonna be like way more reliable it's gonna be wild anyways um oh man i cannot wait this has been amazing thank you so much for jumping in again i if somebody had asked me to jump into a call uh you know two three hours before registration for bitcoin 2022 i would have told them to go fuck themselves so i cannot t <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for jumping in this has Pete, been we did it and you you said no you weren't coming you on no, no, no. <laughs> you didn't just say no he literally accepted all the calendar invites and then one by one stopped showing up. He literally was asked to show up every single day before Bitcoin 2022, the week before. It came one time for 30 minutes and then just ghosted us after that. But we had so much so fun. Nifty, you are an incredible person. Invited. I'm so excited. I was sitting here just like learning. I couldn't I couldn't function by like being a part of this conversation. I had to be the audience. Thank you for the lessons. P God damn it, P. Um, <laughs> okay, guys, sorry. I have like one more thing to shell. Uh, Base the eight is running. It's uh, we're running our June class, which starts June twenty seventh. So if you enjoy talking, listening to me talk about Lightning, you're gonna love listening to me talk about the Bitcoin transaction protocol. Uh, we still got like I think maybe six or seven spots left, so going fast. Uh, we only let like. 18 people in a class um so if you want to come and like supercharge fast track your bitcoin dev of like life career etc we would love to have you in class um we also do this like fun thing which maybe i should show i don't know we like we're trying to do this thing where if you come to base 58 and we end up get helping you get hired at a company that pays us like a recruiting fee we will pay you back the money you paid for the class but we'll like double it um we're still working on setting up those relationships. So this is kind of like a, at some point, we're really hoping we're going to be able to get this like happen for you. But you know, it's like a two or three year after you finish the class thing sort of thing. Um, I don't think it's on our website. It's sort of like a little like of a back room. We got we to gotta update our website. There's a lot of extra info that's not on here. Um, but yeah, so we're super bullish about your ability to take this class and learn a whole bunch about Bitcoin. And we would love to have more people who want to get into Bitcoin Dev come join us because it's going to be great. And Bitcoin needs you. We need more people. Um, That's what it really comes down to. Join the call. Like, join the, the whatever. Force whatever towards, like, Bitcoin amazingness, you know? Like, Rise I to like, the occasion. Yeah, exactly. Like, Become the person you always wanted to be. When you look in the mirror, you will say, I am amazing. Uh, no, again, thank you so much for joining us. And for those that are listening, the website is base58.info. Got it up on the screen. Check it out. As I'm sure you have all uh, come to understand, uh, Nifty is one of the most intelligent, eloquent people in Lightning, and you should seriously consider taking this course. Yeah.